Welcome to the XY Advisor Podcast. To join a global community of financial advisors sharing and learning with one another to drive the positive evolution of financial advice, head to xyadvisor.com. This podcast is brought to you in partnership with Hub24. Hub24 make a difference in the lives of advisors by connecting you to innovative solutions that create opportunities with market-leading managed portfolios and customer service excellence. Want to know more? Visit hub24.com.au. G'day, how's it going? Clayton here from XY, chatting with Nathan, the financial planner who also lifts cars, lifts rocks. Mate, you're a strong man. You got beards. You you make mead, but you also walk people through their financial life. Thank you so much for coming on. No worries. Um, So uh, the reason I thought I'd pop in and say g'day is because I I noticed that you recently won an award. So talk to us about that. Yeah, I uh, I won the Affinia, which is my license, obviously, Advisor of the Year Award, which... Wow. I started with them last year, 12 months ago. Um, so to to walk away with that first year out, I was um, I genuinely cried actually. <laughs> <laughs> I cried everything. I like weddings, <laughs> you know, McDonald's drive through, like it doesn't matter. <laughs> and so I was standing there. I didn't expect to win. There were some pretty big names in the sort of the short list. Wow. And um, so I'm sitting there, and I and my wife had braided my hair because we thought it'd be funny. <laughs> and I'm sitting there in my braided hair and my blue, you know, uh, velvet jacket. And, uh, <laughs> and, and they go Nathan Fredley. And I was like, and I hadn't, I genuinely hadn't written a speech or anything. I was like, I just wow. had no anticipation of, of taking it away. So I just sort of teared up a little bit. Luckily I was only little on the corner of the screen. So no one could see that Although I, I did bring it up, but yeah. So that was pretty cool. And it, it sort of came back to, I think, like with XY, you know, taking part in all that also in the community within Affinia, which is pretty rad um, working with different groups didn't go unnoticed obviously by the by the licensee mm. um yeah and that, that had been yeah completely sort of blindsided me but really really cool to win awesome man and how long have you been um advising you know in general um 2011 so i was an ar at 21 um, goodness yeah so i think at one point i was the the youngest authorized um ref in australia um and yeah started at nav so i did about four or five years there before i left just couldn't couldn't stay there doing it the way it needed to be done. I thought um, went out, did that three months sub licensing under a bloke who then decided that the uh, CFP ethics course was too hard for him, and um, he got out altogether. So we bought the practice um, from him. Oh wow! Um, myself, my business partner, yeah, yeah. and then um, yeah, basically spent the last five five years in October was our fifth birthday. We'd be going to uh, going to school now. Uh, <laughs> spent spent that. Uh, that last five years, effectively just sort of rebuilding it from the ground up, making our way through it. It was a pretty old school business, you know, a lot of small fees, a lot of, you know, um, trial commission percentage based stuff. Not really, you know, it took a lot of transformation, I think, to bring it up to scratch. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, I mean, it's a, it's a very, it's, a, I'd say a common story, like, uh, there's a transition, you purchase a company and it's more traditional and it's, you know, the, the new owners come in and they, they want to, you know, zhuzh it up, so to speak, and, uh, and change a bunch of things. And, 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 you know, it's taking you five years. What's that journey felt like in terms of, you know, your thought process during that time? Do you say to yourself, it's something that I'm glad that we went through, or is it something you say, you know, I, I wish I'd done it a different way, or is it, um, something you think if I'd gone back in time, I would have done things differently. Like what's your view now looking at it five years on? I, I think um, I have the saying self-employment um, is working really hard for just three more months, repeat infinity. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that's pretty much how I describe it. You know, I think in the last five years, how much regulatory change we've had, how much shifts. And, and I've always tried to, stay above what I consider the minimum um, you know, with base philosophies do good and you'll do well. So, mm. um, you know, that got really, really hard for a lot of time, turning off fees, um, switching off clients, um, which paid dividends. You know, we were going through um, remuneration from our licensee at the moment. We're part of one of those 10 year lookbacks. 
Um, and it's paying dividends now because we've got a, a clean, a clean business, no fee for no service, which is great. Um, but at the time, you know, I knew of practices that had one advisor, 600 clients, fees from all of them, no, sir. And I'm sitting there going, this, this is hard. So I, I don't regret any of that. Um, doing it the right way, I think, sleep at night factor. Um, yeah. And I think my, I was actually talking to another advisor from XY the other day about this. My biggest thing he's looking at going out um, on his own was um, you've got to know your numbers. I think I was too apathetic when it came to costs. Um, you know, I, I hired my old assistant from NAB, um, brought her over, paid her the, 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 the bank wage, um, which was, you know, good money, but for a, basically a brand new business, um, put us um, financially in a lot of positions. And I think, you know, looking back at that, just knowing your costs, knowing your revenue, I think understanding revenue and financial planning is really hard. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. We recently made the flick over to Work Sorted, um, which has been really, really good. Their revenue, I suppose, view in terms of what you can see and how you can and understand where your money's coming in, your forecast and that sort of stuff is excellent. Um, whereas I found X plan, you can kind of see what you want to see, but you have to take that data and do something with it. You've got to put it somewhere else, you know, and I think that was a big thing, understanding what was coming in every month, how we're going to get paid and mapping that out. That's probably one of the things I wish I got a handle on earlier. Um, yeah. Interesting. I, I mean, I X plan and, uh, and work sorted kind of feel different roles though, don't they? Like work sorted that practice management and, and X plans, the advice delivery, yeah, um, I find I find Xplan can Xplan can do it, and I think I can I think the the common response I've got when I've looked into things on Xplan it can do it, but can we do this? Yes, but um, is kind of always this point. So we can do revenue stuff, but I found work sorted is built for that. It's built for CRM in terms of client management and, and revenue management and and workflows, and then we yep. still use Xplan for you know financial production, so SOA, yes. modeling tools, that sort of stuff. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, to me, that that makes a lot of sense. Like uh, you, you're using the strengths of, of each of them. And and like, let's face it, uh, I was talking about this with someone the other day, um, like no one's ever been fired for recommending X-Plan, right? Like that, you know, they in every institution, it's because, you know, they, they come with such a huge, uh, you know, tick of approval if you want to count it that. Like in, in, if compliance is, a, is an issue and it is, then, you know, you need someone looking after it. And then on the flip side, work sorted. I've, I've actually had a couple of chats to those guys and they seem really cool. And um, there's, they're definitely coming at it from a different angle and they're aiming to provide something different. And the way that you just described that, that setup, um, that's kind of, if I was to approach it, is pretty spot on with how I would approach it as well. Yeah. I think work sorted know what they do and they do that really well. And they don't try and do anything outside of that. Yeah. Which- Sometimes when you've got, when you are a single AR practice and we're under enormous cost pressure as, as every single, single AR practice knows, taking the plunge to spend more money on something like that, knowing that X-Plan can kind of do it is quite difficult. Um, yeah. But, but I, I, I don't know. I look at X-Plan, this might be controversial. It might be, I don't know. Um, I see X-Plan as a bit of a Frankenstein software, which I think it is. Iris kind of just bought all these modules and slapped them together and they kind of talk. But if you look at, you know, what it does, um, in the sense of production, you've got to enter the same information in sometimes, in some ways, four times to get that outcome. Um, and we look at some of the, the more progressive softwares coming through. Um, I, it's prime for, for disruption. I don't think they've, yeah, I, don't, I think they've relied on, they're the wolf on top of the hill, right? Like they're hungry. They're not hungry. They're sitting there with their big pile of food and they've got 68% market share and, yeah, and that... institutional alignment. And it's just waiting for someone to... <sighs> Yeah, behind, I've, right? I've, I, I think I think there's been a lot to to have given it a red hot go. Um, if you think about Midwinter and Advisor Logic, that there, there has been ones that you know no for a long yet. period of time have been you've tried, and you know they've achieved a level of success. You know, a, a mate of mine, Julian Plummer, he's the or at least was the CEO of uh, Midwinter for a long time, and and they had a a public sale figure of of around you know fifty million or something like that, mm. and um, and then you look at you know, iris and it's two billion like there's there's a there there are there are levels to 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 you know um to this sort of stuff so i think it goes without saying that for as much as I, you know what it is it's like so much change is coming into the industry that a level of security is kind of valued and a level of predictability but i do think i do think those work sorted guys have 
approached it from the right angle because I think you're right. Understanding your numbers in terms of your revenue is such an important aspect of being self-employed or being the employer that that practice management piece is kind of, yeah, when you become, when you launch your own company, it's kind of the most important thing. Like you kind of have to like entry to the game is, can you give advice? Right. That's, that's ticket Mm -hmm. to the game and having a great user experience and delivering excellent financial strategies is sort of like almost mandatory. That's a given, right? That's, but yeah, that's, yeah, what, that's yeah. what you're there to do. Yeah, that is exactly what you're there to do. But the, the skill set that a lot of advisors, when they get into the, the head honcho position is, okay, interesting. Now I've got to measure up all this sort of stuff. And so, yeah, while, you know, because I used to be in, in a similar boat, I was a single AR practice. And there's definitely a bit of a chasm like between, I'd say, three, four $400,000 a year and getting to say over a million. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. it's quite it's quite difficult, but it requires an entire new AR and then complete shift of structure. And you go yes. from being this like self reliant. Um, you know, to your point, like you could be a great planner, but if mm. you're self employed and you're rubbish at business, yep. you won't be successful. Yeah, um, and that's that's where something like a work sort like I'm, I use it as well to manage my own time. I am yep. shocking with time management. I met in the in the email prior, you know, said I'm a Labrador with a tennis ball. If you throw a ball, I will chase <laughs> that ball. And my wife will come over and go, Nathan, put the ball back, put it, put it back, put it back. You already got a ball. Play with the one you have. Right. And so I think that is for me a massive thing. It's like it's always so much to do as a single AR. Yes. Um, at the moment, I don't have any other staff, so I'm I am a jack of all trades. Yep. And so managing your time and being effective and efficient on that is really important. Yes. doesn't mean, you know, you could be the best planner in the world. If you cannot manage your day to day, you just won't get it done. And then I've been having this conversation with a lot of people around scalability. But how do you go from being a single AR with one staff member with, you know, maybe 350 a revenue, 400 a revenue a year of which you have to earn half of that upfront, which how many people, you know, mm. out there are, look like that. How do mm. you make the jump from that position to if you look at a book of a two or three AR practice at 1.2 mil that have got three or four staff, it's a diff- it's a completely different entity. It's totally, no way the same. And I think I think that's where I don't know maybe some resource sharing and that sort of stuff needs to come into effect. Where you've got a you know a five practices that all throw in 50 grand a year into a central company and there's 250 grand. You've got a power plan and you've got you know, an office manager. You've got an assistant. You've got some form of scale on software you've got, I don't know that there's got to be something like that but when you're trying to co- you know get that together while also being cross licensees and having or dealing with this and then having the time to actually go down and do that yeah um you know aligning your processes with financial planners are such independent people you know I'd be like yes. I do it this way because this is the way you do it <laughs> yes. you know it, our ways are slightly different, but I could never do it your way <laughs> unless someone else mandated it. So yes. even just doing something as simple as aligning processes before you make that plunge can be quite difficult. And it requires an entire new thought process around giving up control, um, which is part of the reason why we decided to do our own way. Right. So. No, I fully agree. Um, one of the most successful um because you're talking about processes is uh, I can't remember what program Ben Nash uses, but Ben, Ben Nash, like obviously co-founder of XY, but also a good buddy of mine. And, and we speak about this stuff good, quite a good, bit. Good beard too. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Strong beard game. Definitely. Uh, definitely beard outbeards me on that one. Yeah, well, but you beat him on the lock. So, you That's know, right. it's sort of, you know, 50, 50. Yeah. He, he has focused really hard on getting to that multi AR status. And I think he launched a, in around about 2013, 2014. So it's taken him um, to get to this stage. He's focused on it pretty tightly for a long time. Um, and one of the one of the things that worked really well for him was he's got a piece of software that has all the processes in there. And then he's recorded a video, a Loom video of him doing the process so that whoever joins the company has an easy way to immediately start operating. And I thought I've that was super, that super intelligent. Cool. Yeah, yeah, that was that was a way to like I could 
back when I was a singular AR and I had sort of an, an in-person staff member, then I sort of had external marketing and external uh, power planning as well. I, I wasn't, you know, the skill set I had wasn't getting that internal staff member up and running in an efficient and effective manner. And I think mm-hmm. that's one of the things that he focused on and, and he's done quite well out of that. I think that for me, my staff member recently moved on um, and they, you know, filling that gap now to train someone from the ground up to do that is is really hard. So Daunting. I've been spending a lot of time building the processes in, in the work squad platform so they can follow the bouncing ball. And then exactly that recording, when I do something on Loom, recording it once. Yeah. So, yeah, and someone much smarter than me has sort of said, you, you've got to make the process the problem, not the staff member. So if mm. you focus on the process, any staff member can fill that role. Yes. And that um, means that if someone wants to move on, whether they move up and become planners or you know, tra- tra- transition out or whether you bring someone else in, they leave, you bring someone else in, it doesn't matter because the process is there. Yes. Um, and then the next, the next layer to that that they, they suggested to me was to actually, once they've got, you've got the Loom thing recorded, get that person who does the job to write the steps. Yeah. They might interpret it a different way you would because you're going to take shortcuts because you just know things. Yep. And they're going to be like, oh, hang on, but what about that button? Oh, you just click that. Oh, but yes. why? Okay, yeah. let's fill, fill in some of those gaps. And that can really, I suppose, um, make it more robust. At the end yep. Of the day. No, fully, fully, fully agree. Um, so beyond practice management, because obviously that's a huge uh, challenge, I think, for any singular AR, but it sounds like you're definitely on the pathway to to clarifying that in your mind. Um, I'm always interested in client acquisition. And one of the things that, that we're discussing over email is that, and, and it's always super interesting for me because everyone has a different strategy and yours is Google, right? That's, <laughs> that's, uh, no, but genuinely like that when, when, and I'm, and I want to kind of explore whether it's paid ads or whether it's SEO, but, um, yeah, I don't actually get a lot of people that say Google is the top way. If I think about, I can name a couple off the top of my head. Um, Brett, who does um, a lot of international or expat sort of stuff, he's he's probably nailed, at least to my mind, Google in in the best way. And he's, he's got really high ranking SEO stuff and he's been doing it for five, six, seven years. Um how do you use Google and talk, talk to me about the process and the success of it all? Absolutely. Accidentally. Um, <laughs> so I just, I, a friend of mine, she's in content marketing. She said, Nathan, your SEO is just terrible. So, <laughs> so she, she gave me some pointers. She, she basically jumped on. I managed my website for weeks. It's nothing fancy. We sorted out the SEO stuff. I established a Google profile. I run one ad for general financial planning. I run one for aged care advice. Um, The Google, the reason Google works, I can't even tell you. I have 14 five-star reviews and my active participation in that process is that every single person I speak to, so my my acquisition process, I suppose, is for half an hour, everyone gets it. Everyone gets half an hour of my time. I've stopped doing an hour, hour and a half. I've stopped trying to explain the world to everyone. You, you just can't do it. We don't have time. Totally. An hour or a half an hour of who are you? Um, what's your, what's your problem and why now? Mm-hmm. Do you even need advice? Am I the right person? Mm. Um, and in that meeting, I was explained to them. We're not gatekeepers. No one needs a financial planner. Um, mm. We are, we are there as a professional to help you solve a problem. You can yes. solve this problem yourself if you have the time, means, and, and ability to understand it. And desire. You outsource it. Exactly. Yeah. Well, you can outsource it. And if you outsource it, you pay a premium. So straight away, we're setting up that, that sort of arrangement. Um, and, but at the end of today, no matter what happens, I'm going to try and give you a positive experience. Um, and I ask from you that if you, if you think I've earned it, that I want a five-star review. Um, and if I, uh, if I haven't earned it, I want you to tell me what I didn't do so I can either fix that now or fix that for later. And, and it, my, my interest is genuine. I want people to see us on Google and go, this person is not going to try and flog me something. They're here to actually help me. Mm. The inquiries I've received this year. So solely, uh, I think about 80% of my revenue this year has come from, for new, new businesses come from Google historically relied on um, accounting and mortgage broking referrals. Mortgage broking almost shut up shop this year. Accounting referrals shut up shop this year. I've just had Google referrals. And I've had people ring up and say, 
um, we want to upgrade our home. So we're currently living in this house. We either want to renovate, um, buy here or buy there. If we buy it, the se second place, we don't have to pay private school fees. What's it look like? Cool. I can help you with that. The way I would do that, you know, talk strategy paper, um, you know, e explain the process through that, um, all the rest of that sort of stuff. So this is a, so that no SOA advice piece um, and help them and charge them $2,500 for that. And yeah. they both said that was some of the best money we ever spent. They then came back and paid me for a fee on the insurance advice. Um, we were able to refer them out and help them find um, a good estate planner and a good mortgage broker. They got their stuff together. That came from Google. I had one the other day. She is has got an issue with her ex abusive ex partner. So he went to his men's behavior course. Now he's got six days out of 14. She's paying him child support. And he historically has earned more than her, but he's a contractor. So something's going on there and she wants to understand her options. Now, immediately, that's not something I can help with. But what I was able to do was connect her with um, a good family lawyer, and it sort of explains some of the things that we can and can't do in that process. So half an hour conversation, great experience. You know, that's, I suppose, what you're chasing. Because in that context, what we're moving away from with that is I need to see a financial advisor because I have a problem, mm. not I need income protection. I need to look at my super. I need, no, I need them to help me solve a problem. And yes. then our role and, and what I sort of articulate to clients is we diagnose what the problem actually is. And we help you find the best worst solution because no solution is perfect. Let's work through some of them and get to that. So I don't know, accidentally on Google, but constantly ask. So I'm always asking for Google reviews. What can I do? You know, and when I'm working with a client, what can I do to earn that five star Google review or exceed your expectations, writing that down and coming back, circling back at the end of the process and saying, did I? And if I didn't, I'm going to go and fix that before we finish our work together. And that I think they always find it amusing when I bring it up. Um, I've actually got one next week. I usually wear suspenders and a three piece suit and what have you. And they've, they've requested instead of just being casual COVID attire that I put on the suspenders. So that's part of my, you know, <laughs> if that's what I got to do to get my five star review, I'll put on those suspenders. <laughs> <laughs> that's so uh, yeah. Um, what's your average client look like? Uh, do you deal mostly with accumulators, with retirees? What, what's, do you, do you have an ideal client, an avatar? I've always thought you don't, you don't, you don't choose your client, they choose you. Um, looking through my client base, it's um, lead client is 80% um, female, um, two major age groups, uh, 55 to 65 year old um, or 35 to 45 year old and, and all their, their parents. So if it's a 55 year old, it might be that they're the client or they're the lead, but the client might be their parents in aged care. Right. Um, in my, so majority of my clients are, are women. Um, the 35 to 45 year olds are generally in professional occupations, not always. And the often I find the retirement clients are usually he's managed the money to this point. We've got this far, but we need to do more. She's taken over and then she's sort of vice. Huh. That tends to be that sort of the common factors inside of that. But in terms of wealth, in terms of what they look like, I'm currently working with a, a couple that have a combined income of $400,000 a year and a couple that have a combined income of $59,000 a year. Hmm. Um, you know, both, both from Google. <laughs> um, so, you know, it doesn't, and both of them get charged the same fee relative to, to the work that they do. So um, for most accumulators, it's sort of 3,300 plus um, either for insurance or we take insurance comp, depending on what they want to do yep. or um, retirees. It's a 4,400 cap fee model where it's whatever we do. Here's the calculator. It's worked out at 5,700 bucks. I'm going to do it at $4,400 because I want to make sure I do a good job without you having to worry about fees. So, yeah, I think it's, that's a weird, weird bracket. And, and to that point too, uh, something I've discovered is that um, over 30% of my client base is actually what I would call dark green. Um, so in, inherently, uh, I don't really use the word ethical because uh, that's open-ended, but you know, interest in sustainability and, and responsible investing. And that's something that has sort of tipped me into to doing this further. Right. So if you've got an 80% uh, exposure to female clients, and then you're seeing a large portion of those being sustainable um, investors. So you're thinking about getting further and further into that space. Yeah. Marketing wise. Yeah. I think process wise, I've always done, I've always used whatever ethical investments were available. Um, I right. just think to use that word again, I just think recently last couple of years, research houses have been taking them seriously. Um, in Western Europe, a lot of the funds that are managed in Western Europe, have ESG mandates. Um, ESG isn't a thing. ESG is in five years time, we'll be looking back on ESG 
and say, remember how ESG was this premium thing where now it's part of actually part of 70% of um, Australian fund managers processes, which it is currently. It's like saying, looking back and saying, you know, Corona beer, if you remember five years ago, that was sold as, as premium beer. You paid more money to get a 50 cent beer from Mexico and it was marketed that way. Yeah. It's the same as, you know, a BMW in Australia is a premium car. The rest of the world, it's like a Subaru. It's a good car, but it's just somehow, uh, you know, tiered that. And I feel like ESG to me, we're having all these conversations about whether we should be considering the environmental impact of a good company, whether we should be considering their social impact, their governance. That's risk management 101. If you're not doing that, <laughs> what are you doing? And I think, you know, that as a point, and then sustainability is a thing. You know, I think mm. you don't have to be an ethical investor to, to ensure that you've considered the impact of climate change on your client's portfolio. Mm. If you have an accumulator coming at 35 years old, their investment time frame is 60 years. You have to consider the world of 60 years time <laughs> and rest prove that. They got sued by a 25-year-old and settled out of court. What? I didn't yeah, follow. Yeah, it was on Melbourne Cup Day, so a lot of uh, a lot of news was more around horses. But the um, yeah, rest got a twenty-five year old took rest to court about their disclosure of climate change impact in their portfolio, and they settled outside the court. Stop it! Now, look it up. It's a thing. It's it's real. We have a responsibility to consider, you know, what the portfolio is going to look like in thirty years, and and all the research houses have a layer of sustainability. But if you talk to the big names. Email Magellan and go, hey, can I have your ESG policy? They're surprisingly strong. You look at, you know, Platinum's the same thing. All the big, all the big fund managers have strong ESG policies, whether they advertise them or not. And I think this idea of ESG being this, you know, weird and wonderful, you're only going to invest in weird hippie things. And I'm a little bit Northcote, so everything's a weird hippie thing in the People's Republic of Northcote. But <laughs> I, I think, yeah, this it's just nonsense. We're looking at good quality companies that are going to be around for our clients in 30 years time and continue generating revenue um, to, to suit their needs. That's what we should be focusing on. So I think, yeah, I think that's part of it. So marketing wise, absolutely. I'm, I'm going to make that, that push into that space. I like it. I like talking about it. I'm really into it. I've recently joined RIA um, and I'm doing ah. a lot of research in, in that space, um, which I definitely recommend if anyone wants to start in that RIA website, they've got a responsible um, returns tool. Um, jump on that. You can actually see to be listed as certified, um, um, re your investment you actually have to disclose your holdings you have to you have to go through a process so if you want to know whether a client whether a portfolio has something you want to put a client in bhp for example i'm um, sorry you want to put a client in say um pendle's um, ethical fund if the client is opposed to holding bhp well you can find out if pendle's ethical fund holds bhp now whether it's a good idea or not whether it's a sustainable investment whether bhp are out of thermal coal altogether these days and are actually putting heaps of money into the space is irrelevant it gives the advisor more power to have that conversation. So yeah, that's, um, that was a bit of a rant, wasn't it? No, no, that's, uh, that's mate. It's super. I, I learned a bunch of stuff. It does. It, um, as, as you're aware, um, I saw you talking about it on X, Y, but I've done about 10 episodes now of it, of the ethical, uh, podcast series or the, the you know, the ESG podcast series. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's far more advanced than I anticipated. You know, it's sort of like ten podcasts in, I'm I'm kind of like, oh, this is uh, this is big news. Like, it's almost I almost feel a little bit late to the party. A part of me, the the only concern I have is on that sort of stuff is and and perfect example is the BHPs of this world. Imagine if right, imagine if no one invest, no one wanted to hold BHP. It's going to have such huge impacts on the world. Right. So the BHP are an important company for sustainability, right? Like if we, if we don't have min- minerals, we can't build giant fans. Like just, <laughs> you can't, you can't. Yeah. And, and I think that's a really important thing around like, there's a difference between, and this conversation needs to be with clients around this. There's a difference between, I don't want to hold something. I want to create a positive impact or I want to advocate. That's Mm. a a massive difference between those three things because I don't want to hold something says, I I don't want to hold BHP and Rio. Historically, they've they've been against me and one of them decided to blow up or an Aboriginal heritage site. And you know what? Not not down for that. Cool. And there's some great sustainable funds that would hold those. So you've got to be aware of that sort of stuff. Um, But then there's people that say, I want to actually invest in something that's positive for the future. And that can Mm. be done in two ways. That's impact. 
Um, stuff like you know, Pangana Web Fund, really, really cool fund um, that in invests in, uh, and I think as BNP Paribas have got an environmental trust. Um, uh, there's a New World Fund by, I can't remember what they're called. Um, they're, they're funds that try and find companies that have got, got good quality companies, not just startups, like large companies that are, are making strong amounts of revenue from benefiting from from this transition into a green economy. Right? So this is the this is the buying Kodak or or you know Apple in 1992, right? That if you're going to invest in in water as a as a theme or invest in construction, um, you know a company that creates a um, software that might monitor you know, and calculate the impacts of, of, of climate and, and, um, and density on a building to, you know, for the environmental energy rating, all buildings have to be a certain environment, environmental energy rating. That's only going to go up every year. So with that, a company that makes that kind of software will benefit. So there's, there's, a, there's a theme here that you can make money out of this thing. So that's sort of, I suppose, you know, that's the impact. And then there's the advocacy stuff. And I think this is where Australian super are, are, are unashamedly in this space. You know, they hold BHP. They've got some pretty strong ESG processes, but they are massive in the uh, advocacy. And they, they look at a company like BHP and they say, look, guys, we hold a lot of you and you can't keep doing things this way because it's bad for bad, bad for business. And so the threat of, of um, divestment is there, but also we, we know you've got the capability, the size and the resources to change and, and to just ignore those companies that have got the capability to actually do good is also not necessarily the ideal outcome. But I think that is a client conversation because there's no right or wrong. It comes back to what their, you know, their views are. I have, a, I have an ethical client who started off that conversation because she didn't want to hold Maccas. Um, <laughs> she has a cafe in Belgrave. If you know anything about Belgrave in Eastern, Eastern Melbourne, they had a legal battle with McDonald's for 13 years to keep them out. Um, and that's how that conversation started in terms of the ethical issues. Anything you don't want to hold, I don't want to hold McDonald's. Wow. So that makes a lot of sense. Cool. Let's explore this further. And, yeah. and you know, we started diving into all that sort of stuff. So, yeah, I think that they're the three parts of that conversation that we need to be having. Um, and they can open things up that aren't just whether or not you want to buy giant fans. I think um, a lot of the, the good quality sustainable investment isn't in power generation it's in water food and waste um that's three massive challenges we have globally but also areas where if someone gets it right our clients can make a lot of money out of that sort of stuff too which is exactly what you want i mean yeah helping your clients make a lot of money is is super high on the agenda and if you can do it in a i always think about it in terms of being a mercenary and a missionary like how do you just make as much money as possible while just having as as positive impact on the world as possible. I, I, like I don't I like think that, that they are exclusive at all. I think they can definitely work hand in hand. And, and I think that's a really good way of looking at it. How can you, you know, by, by focusing on the company business models that will flourish as we head more into a, and we call it green society. Um, yeah. It's, it's a, I mean, it's just smart investing really. It's do, do good and you'll do well. And, and I yeah. think, Someone asked me this the other day about what about your retiree clients that aren't overly interested? Like, are you just going to shy away? You're not going to speak to anyone? Absolutely not. I, if I'm talking to a client that's not interested in infrastructure or not interested in international shares, and they came to me and said, Nathan, I want a portfolio of blue chip stocks. I don't go and give them a portfolio of blue chip stocks. I educate them on the importance of diversification of other asset classes, of what's available. This is part of that process. Mm. You educate them on not only what's important now, you know, and, and taking advantage of things like tech and, and, and what have you that's flourishing now. But if we're investing for 10, 20, 30 years time, we need to be thinking about what is going to be viable in the future. Um, it's just not saying, oh, you're not, you don't have any ethical bias. I'm not going to look at this at all. Um, this is saying you don't, you're, you're not placing your own value on investing above mm. Um, potential lower returns, which interestingly, if you actually look at some of the you know funds and what's out there, they're outperforming. And my my dark green fund outperformed literally everything over the last twelve months, which is yeah, just insane. Um, but the I think yeah, that that's another argument altogether. There is this sort of idea that just because it's green means it won't make money or to make less, you have to give up some returns for your own values. That can be part of the conversation, um, but you can also flip it and say, well, would you rather not look at sustainability to get lower returns? And I think the client will come back and say, no, I just want, I just want you to make me money, Nathan. I want you, I want my portfolio to do well. Um, if I don't have any biases, that's fine, but we still need to guide them through diversification, sustainability, all that sort of stuff, like we would anything else or outsource it to multi-managers. If that's not our skill set. 
but we should be going to the multi-managers and saying, hey, rest, what do you do in this space? Mm. You know, why are you considering sustainability? Are you considering um, the 30-year time frame of your investment? Or are you more concerned with a three-year time frame to stay out of the bad books so you don't get your funds shut down by the government? You know, that I think that's a, a conversation we need to be having with, with multi-managers and industry funds and that sort of stuff as well. Wow, man. Now, getting to the actual advice delivery piece, I, I'm keen to ask you what your views are on scaled. Um, <laughs> if, you've, if you've seen X, Y at all in the last year, you've probably seen me talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> Precisely. Um, what, what are your views on things like scaled advice? I, I, I feel like we're, we're setting fire to this thing called scaled advice to make excuses for our advice being so expensive. Um, you know, it's just, this big straw man outside and sure we'll, we'll chant and, and dance around it, but it's not actually going to make our crops grow any better. If anyone wants to complain about the fact we can't do scaled advice, first go and read the 2015 RG 244. And on page, I want to say 116, it might be 46. It's one or the other. It's 116. There's an SOA there. I scaled it by a SOA that's three pages long. Right. And that was given in 2015. ASIC are not saying we can't do scaled advice. Um, look at the SOA in uh, IG90, I think it's on page 46. It's 23 pages long and it's pretty, it's pretty comprehensive. Don't get me wrong, neither of them are compliant by today's standards and definitely potentially couldn't pass the CR depending on what records were on file. But they're examples of the structure of the statement of advice and there's nothing stopping us from doing scaled advice. Licensees definitely have a card to play. Different licensees view scaled advice differently. I know the licensee I used to be a part of it, there was no strategy papers. There was no four to form SOA. Really? It was always a massive thing. Yeah. You couldn't do any of that. It was always the SOA. Even an aged care advice, if there's no product, they were just like, no, SOA. Wow. Yeah. And that was a conservative ex-bank licensee. So that that's, and I think some of that, some of that heavy handed, um, uh, we want to say licensee compliance stuff has, I think has pushed through into Advisors historically have relied on policy from licensees, not relied on understanding the laws and principles that we're actually, you know, sticking to. And I think if we go back to what we're actually supposed to be doing, even with the code overlaid, if you're doing the right thing around the documentation and we earn the right to do this, I, I add, I don't think we've earned the right to cry out about anything at the moment. I think the last decade has, has said we need to actually show that we can do it first. But the actual documents don't need to be that long if we're doing all the right stuff around it. And, mm -hmm. and the appendix and attachments and evidence and showing the client all the calculations and, and blah, blah, that we've done, we might, might be still encumbersome, but they don't need to be personalized and given to them. And if you actually look at what's available, you can scale advice and you can scale advice now, even with an SOA, you know, a client comes in and says, I would like you to help me with my superannuation account. And you say, cool, look, you're 64 years old. You should be thinking about retirement, blah, 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 blah. You go into this full conversation and then they say, no, I just want super. And you go, okay, well, Informed consent, you need to know what something's going to cost before you can be make informed consent. So you need to quote them what a comprehensive plan would be. And I say that because, you know, Clayton, if I said to you right now, I've got a 55 ULED LED TV out the back, what do you want to call them? Do you want it? What's the first Hell thing yes. you think? Yeah. Or, or, or how much? Like, how much? Exactly. Yes. <laughs> hey, do you want a retirement plan? Oh, no, I don't. No, <laughs> that sounds like it would be expensive. Is it expensive? <laughs> you go, well, look, from what you're going to want, you've just superannuation advice is what you've seen, you, you've seen me about. That's going to be $2,400. Um, the reason that's quite a bit of money is because there's a lot of base work I have to do in order to make sure I'm doing a good job. Not because I've got to meet my physique. No, I want to do a good job for you. It costs a certain mm -hmm. amount to get great advice. For another 1100 bucks, I can consider and, and give you financial modeling on your retirement. And we can look at campus pensions, da, 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 and some Centrelink because a lot of the groundwork has already been done. So mm. would you rather pay $2,400 or 3300 for example? Mm. And then they can, they can select what they want to scale into. And that's okay. We can scale advice. But, but, the, but the key to that is how much work do we have to do to do the most basic advice? And that's, I think, where a lot of people are struggling. I would argue you should be doing enough that you need to be able to give good answers, which with or without for CR is still a bit of work. And my argument is always that advice is expensive because it's a premium service. It, it is by nature expensive. It's a problem but it is, I think we need to open up to the difference between a, a great financial advice industry as a profession and cheaper services. You can go and get conveyancing done by a conveyancer and pay 500 bucks and go and they stamp the things and they move. Or you can go and see a lawyer and get them to assess contracts and, and go into more work. And that, that, that 
a clear definition between those two things is really important because I think the scout advice piece is just, as I said, we're praying for rain, thinking that our dance is going to make it rain when actually it will just rain or it won't. That's a, the, that concept between the conveyancer, the $500, the stamping of the tickets, and then going to see the lawyer to examine whether the contracts are in, the, in your best interest. Such a, is, if I think about what advice looks like five to 10 years in the future, it's kind of how I'm looking at it. Like, you know, you've got this big US-based company who wants to come in and purchase uh, AMP, right? So the external money is super bullish Mm-hmm. on uh on australian financial services and you know iwf has obviously had some some high profile purchases as well and so you've got these two now very large financial services companies who have many many advisors i mean if you look at what's happened with uh st james in the uk uh they went through a similar thing to us and in the end they had to scope out a, a an agent almost like an agent, so a, a, like a, like a low cost scale of advice. I see something like that popping back up again, the conveyancer, if you want to call it that option. And then on the other side, you've got independent advice, which is, you know, taking the questions across the whole market. So it almost appears to be an upcoming schism in the market in terms of the two sep. you know, yes, there's affordability. Yes. There's compliance and, and yes, there's, uh, you know, like people walk in, they know what they're purchasing from the Ford dealer, mm. right? But then on the other hand, you've got, let's take your entire position and it is a premium service and it c- does come at a cost. And that does very much reflect my view of where advice is headed in the past, just because you can't solve both of those problems uh, at the same time. There's a difference between a bulk build GP and an obstetrician that you pay to, to help, you know, give birth. And so like one's private, one's public, one's low cost, one's high cost, one's for mass, one's for smaller amount of people. It's just in every single segment of society, you have separation of uh, skill sets. And uh, the fact that that hasn't been done efficiently and effectively in financial advice tells me that it just has to because it's kind of getting torn as two separate directions where a lot of people are interested in delivering super comprehensive, super valuable advice that, you know, where advisors, especially if you think about all the advisors in X, Y, like that's exactly what they're trying to do is like, how do I get better at advice and deliver more value? Right. And then earn more value in return. Right. And so there's this whole push towards becoming a, you know, the positive evolution of financial advice, but then all of the, ASIC, all the stuff that's coming out with ASIC and, every, you know, a lot of product providers, it's like, how do we deliver scaled advice to totally separate It's, it's not even the same thing. I th- I think you're hundred percent right. It's, we're trying to solve two problems with, with the same solution. And I think what's interesting about that is that that cost of advice piece that you just mentioned there. So I don't know anyone on XY who would be willing to give actual affordable advice. So when ASIC did that survey, it was like 6% of Australians would spend $1,000 on advice. Mm. So going back to us being a single AR, how much, how fast and efficient are you going to have to be to generate 350, 400 grand of revenue to see 400 people a year at a thousand bucks a pop? Yeah. Like who, like if you want to do that, sure. But on the flip side of that, what we're actually about to do is create this, we're making this problem worse. So, you know, we're going to have to ring all of our insurance clients, anyone who's got big back books, and we're going to have to get what looks like a signed letter from them saying, yes, I want, you're allowed to continue receiving commissions. Yeah. That's going to create a whole pool of things because people are going to go, well, I, if I have to do something for this commission and I'm getting 50 bucks a year, I'm just not going to service this anymore. So I'm going to cut the client off. So now this is client who's got some policies can refund the comms, some can't, but this is client who goes, well, where do I go for help? And they ring the insurer and the insurer goes, I'm sorry, we can't help you. We don't have the capability to do this. So we're going to give you to a planner. So they refer you to a planner and the planner goes, oh, that's great. I'm going to have to do a statement of advice. That'll be $3,300. And the client <laughs> wants to reduce their insurance. So we've got this massive issue where, um, yeah, I think we're going to, and it's going to get worse because there is a gap in the marketplace for people who just need to be serviced. Yes. Um, and I think when we start and I've sort of tried to rem- remove my reliance on my commission is becoming part of an arrangement or it's not, but 
we remove, we're not saying commission is a bad thing because it can be really beneficial totally. for a client I who can't afford a fee. Yep. always give it option. But if we remove our reliance from passive income and and become more, you know, delivery orientated, um, then hopefully the product providers need to step up in the space. And to your point, you go to a car dealership at, at Ford, you get a Ford. You mm-hmm. go to McDonald's, you don't ask them for a Whopper. You get a Big Mac, you know what you're in for. And, and for a role that can be a, an actual salesperson, but is moderately trained. So they're not just like, oh, what would you like? They can talk through steps and levels, that, all that sort of stuff. That needs to exist. Totally. But, but not necessarily be us. Totally. Um, and I think that, or if, if someone wants to do that, they need to have the capability to move their business model to that and be under a different regime, I yes. would say, a different requirement, a different expectation but clearly have to demonstrate that the client understands they're not, for example, in the US it's fiduciary, right? They're not fiduciary. Yes. Um, you know, and and there's a very, very clear line in the sand. And the client can then go, that's fine. I don't care. I just need to get some life insurance. You know what? I actually do want to see someone on a bigger scale. Totally. And uh, I tell you what's hilarious. You, you mentioned the issue with uh, the orphaned, which is always one of my favorite words in financial planning, but the orphaned. Uh, it's such a sad of, word, isn't it? It is. Oh with- my God. All these, all these little like, you know, they're holding their cap and their insurance policy in one hand. It's like, please, sir. Yeah. Service? <laughs> service? service. Yes. <laughs> you want service. Um, so anecdotally, um, my wife, Vera, she got her uh, advice through a friend who was, uh, you know, her, her insurance policy through a friend who was a financial planner. Uh, he's no longer financial planning anymore. And so we called the insurance company and we said, Hey, uh, we want to do this thing to the insurance. And they go, ah, uh, you can't. And we're like, how come that? And they said, well, own, it's a product that only a financial planner can, can make an edit to, uh, to or make a change to. And I said, well, who's the planner on the, on the, on the policy now? And then the person on the phone, God bless them. They're like, okay, this is the email. It's like, and this is, you know, it's very similar to this. It was like something along the lines of no advisor underscore, you know, October (laughs) underscore, uh, you know, 2019 underscore. And like they're reading at, you know, and the name of of the company that we'd ended up at. And I was like, I was like, I'm just going to hold you up here. That's clearly not an advisor's <laughs> email. That's clearly like a pool of uh, products that are not being looked after by anyone. I said, so because of that, clearly there's no advisor attached to it. Can I just do some edits? And they're like, no. And then so, so obviously I've got a handful or more than a handful. I've got heaps of mates that are advisors. So then I called one of them and I said, is it all right if I you know, we'll, I'll do all the signing and everything, but can you take on this policy so that we're actually able? And he goes, well, not necessarily. Like if I take on a policy now, I then, you know, I'm accepting this historical, like uh, appropriateness of the advice and everything. And I'm going, Oh my God. Like I understand this industry have operated in this for a decade and I cannot believe the difficulties that I've come up against. And so to your point, if there is going to become millions of these people, it's going to be pandemonium. On the flip side, lots of uh, potential for business because like it, it became too difficult and not that I wanted to do this, but like everyone's, you know, knock on wood, we're all in good health. So we will just do the policy again, right? Like for us in this situation, it just makes no sense. Even though, it was locked in, you know, level back in the day and all this sort of stuff. But it's just and, and, and now looking at green value, is it a green value? Age sixty five by October next year. Like, what's gonna happen when all these changes come through and you can't get a hundred guarantee renewable occupation policy anymore? A hundred percent. Is it, it that it, it it's just it's insane. The only it, it's it I would say it's a downside for clients. The only upside I can possibly see is there's just gonna be a lot of people who will need advice. And and I guess that's the only upside in all of that. Yeah. I think um I'm actually compiling the list at the moment. So I wrote an email out to all the insurers um and just said, Hey, 
in terms of commissions, can we turn them off? Um, does the client benefit from that or does it just stop going Great to question. me? Yep. Um, you know, how does that work? Da, 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 da. What about previous series? Blah, blah, blah. And then self-service, can they ring up themselves? Can they make these alterations or this sort of stuff? And, and I've heard back from a few of them. And when I finish getting that list, I will post it to the XY group because I think it's super valuable. That is super valuable. And I've already discovered like common sure are working on it, yep. but they can't. So if a client... Uh, wants me to turn off their comms because they don't want to have to be getting something. That's fine. Just so you know, common sure are going to get their commission anyway and you'll yeah. just be in the orphan bucket. Yeah. Oh, man. Oh. Yeah. Right. Whereas I had a, actually had an inquiry. Um, someone had existing tell policy. Um, husband had um, bone, uh, blood cancer. Terrible story. Just claimed on trauma. And she wanted to make adjustments to his policy and increase it. Obviously can't do that. But also her own. She, I said, she sort of said, look, I've seen the importance of this. Um, I want to boost my trauma cover. I want to boost my life cover. Can you help me? And I said, look, to be honest, I can, um, but I'm going to charge you a flat fee and rebate any commi- the increased commission I get. It's going to cost you $2,400, give or take a couple of hundred bucks com to increase your policy to a $300 a year. Yeah. Now, tell can do this. So I said, what I would suggest, you know how much cover you want. You know, speak to them. If you want advice, come and see me. I said, if you want advice on your broader circumstances, it makes sense. It's going to be the yes. same cost for me. Yes. Um, but I said, you're going to have to do that first. And what that's, what that's going to start, I suppose, creating though, is a bit of a, I'm sorry, you're like, you're just too small. I, I can't help you. I, yeah. I, we don't want to create this bad environment where people ring advisors and they go, I'm sorry, I can't help you. It needs to be a conversation. If this is what it costs, do you think that would be valuable? Yes. Well, I don't think so, but you can tell me that, but well, maybe we can look at some other advice as part of that. But I think, yes. yeah, we're going to get a massive raft of people just washing their hands and policies because they can't get hold of, let alone get um, confirmation, get hold of people. Yes. Someone needs a claim. Yes. And oh, man. To do. Oh, man. You know, let alone make any alterations on policies or whatever. They don't know what to do. And the insurers are spending so much time, energy, and resources on rebuilding their entire product line. Yeah. Um, and they're cutting costs left, right, and center, and blah, 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 blah. blah. It's going to be so interesting to see this these sort of things are running concurrently. You know, we've yes. got, as soon as reasonably practicable, we should um, contact our clientele. Blah, blah, blah. Well, when that starts happening across the board and, and it's almost complete, then what happens when we start seeing these claims come through, alterations come through? What's, what are the implications of that going to be? I, I'm, I'm concerned. <laughs> I think nothing. Hey, a- absolutely. 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 I, I, you know, I know it sounds ridiculous feeling sorry for, for multi-billion dollar multinational companies, but um, yeah, the, the insurance industry as a whole, it's, it's just they're in, in a lot of ways, like just forced into a corner, um, you know, from every direction. I think advisors have done an overly good job at claiming for their clients, making them completely unprofitable. The government saying, hey, we don't want the whole industry to collapse so that we're going to remove all of these features, holus bolus across the industry. Advisors going, wait a second, the prices are going up and my clients are getting less. Uh, what's going on? And it's, it, it's actually, there's no like, there's, there's no bad ones and good ones. It's just reality it, it because we of don't you. have any insurers we don't have any insurers right no absolutely and and, yeah. and and the and the government was legitimately concerned that everyone was going to leave the country but like three three years ago afro came out and we're like hey we don't know if this is really sustainable guys what do you think we should do something about it and then they got into an upfront price war and everyone started applying discounts to their first year premiums but this is literally the opposite of what they were because, <laughs> asking for because can't... they're getting squeezed, right? Well, but also if one makes a move, everyone else has to make a exactly. move. Exactly. They and, all and... have to discount. And yeah. it just went the, it just snowballed the complete wrong direction. Yeah, it's, it's tough. It's it a takes tough. some chutzpah to kind of go, or a brand new business model. It'd be interesting to see how Neos go in all of this because from what I understand, their IP was already standalone profitable. It did not. You know, cross profit from um, anything else. So I don't think they're going to have to make any changes and they don't have some of the hangovers that the other businesses do have in terms of some of the old policies. So I'm really interested to see what they, what their pricing is going to do when you've got, you know, the BTs and tails in one part that have already announced their increases of 15 to 30%. And you've got the others that will at some point in the near future. If NEOS can kind of coach through that, they'll go in as, hey, you know, we've been doing a good job. I know we're not the best price-wise, but, you know, we're doing a good job to we're now also really competitive price-wise and doing a good job. And I'm actually, I don't really think resolution life or um, 
in integrity. But I think watching Neos at least, I'd be interested to see how they progress through this and if they come out on top because of um, because of how they're positioned. A little bit of leadership, they hard line on certain things, don't have certain features that have you know lost them in my case as some business. And then you know, but I, I'm I'm wondering if they were a little, had a little bit more foresight in their design. Well, who knows? I mean, yeah, obviously any new business to market is just going to have a, a, a natural competitive advantage, mm. but also like the size of those existing companies, they're just so big that, um, you know, assuming that the, assuming the industry is sustainable and that's a, that's a, that's a exactly. due to many different <laughs> factors, but assuming yep. that it remains sustainable and, and it remains, um, yeah, I, I mean, it plays such a, unbelievably valuable part in society and but my whole thing is hey let's just make sure everyone sticks around that's that's just you know my my definitely my whole thing mate i've grabbed a lot of your time today and and undoubtedly we could uh continue going so i it's been such a great chat i would love to have you come on again sometime but mate thank you so much for spending your time and walking us through you're obviously a, a very interesting gentleman we didn't even get to the part that you're a you know a strong man in your downtime so there's a lot of stuff that um we can cover next time we come on and um if you're ever up in sydney you can um come bench bench, bench press me mate i would never be able to keep up with this so uh yeah, yeah and that sounds good when we can eventually cross the border we, um, exactly come up and visit and uh and uh, it was good to be on. And yeah, I think that time went really, really quickly. <laughs> yes, it often does. It often does. All right, mate. I'll, um, I'll shoot off now, but great to chat and speak soon. Okay, bye.